My name's Harold Goodwin, and I'm talking about tourism and climate change in a finite world. This is something about which I am now extremely concerned. But I looked yesterday at what was happening in the UK in the inquiry about COVID. And Professor David Alexander was talking to the House of Commons committee, looking into what happened during COVID and the management of that pandemic in the UK. And he reported hearing in a lecture given by the Red Cross in 2008 from the person making the presentation. My job is to tell you something you don't want to know and ask you to spend money you haven't got on something you don't think will happen. And it seemed to me that that was a pretty good example of what's happening with climate change. We know too that climate change is causing Lassa fever to extend its deadly reach far beyond Nigeria and into West Africa. And where I live in Kent, we're expecting malaria to come back to the marshes in the way that we had marsh fever in the past. Climate change will have health implications as well. I am extremely concerned about what's happening to children's understanding of the world and the extent of the mental health issues which are arising. This is some data done last year, looking at 31 countries and asking people whether they would be having children or not, whether they thought it would be a good idea to have children. You see the research was done in 31 countries last year. You can see that 60% probably will, at least at the moment, think they'll have children. 40% are thinking that they won't. And you can see that there's significant national variation in this, um, from Egypt at one extreme to Indonesia at the other. But the 31 is the country average for those people who strongly or somewhat agree that they won't be having children because of the effects of climate change. Now, I'm in the fortunate position that I don't have any children or grandchildren. But I'm still deeply worried about the prospects for people who are being born now and who are going to have to live through the consequences of climate change. But I wanted first to go back to the history. This is uh, an image I can remember still seeing for the first time in 1968, when I was 16. And it's the famous Earthrise photograph taken from Apollo 8. What that should have done is make us realise that we live in a tiny spaceship in the middle of an enormous universe and that there is only planet A, there is no planet B. I know a few rich men are fantasising about colonising other planets as though it's not enough that we've screwed up this one, but it doesn't seem to me very likely that the quality of life on any other planet at which you arrive in a spaceship is going to be anything like the pleasure that's been available to us living on our planet, planet Earth. So if we look back, 1972, I'm at university in York doing politics. We have an international politics course. And that's the year of the first UN International Conference on Environment and Development. The first Man and the Environment Conference was in 72. 40 years later, I'm approaching retirement at the end of my working life. We are at Rio plus 20. And the reality is four major international conferences and frankly, very little progress on sustainable development and arguably even less progress on coping with climate change. My generation has largely wasted 40 years. I make this point partly as an apology and partly to encourage future generations to try to move a lot faster to deal with these problems which are going to beset you and your children and their children in the future. So 40 years ago, the Club of Rome published Limits to Growth. I still have a copy of that it was never mentioned in my university course, but it did make the Sunday Times and I purchased a copy online. And I read the book and thought, there's no way that we will be that crazy 
to allow this to happen. It was a series of projections about what would happen if we carried on with business as usual for the next 40 years. Over-tourism in the field I work in is a classic example of the limits to growth and of the consequences of living in a finite world. But I don't particularly want to talk about tourism today. I want to talk more generally about the problems confronting our species on planet Earth. Over-tourism is a consequence of doing no more than paying lip service to sustainability. And it's because people were doing no more than paying lip service to sustainability that I launched Responsible Tourism in 2002 at a side event to the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg in 2002. We're simply not making progress fast enough. Speed it up a little. There are some people doing some fantastic things. We know a lot now about what needs to be done. But the truth is, we're not doing it. There's been some research done looking at the consequences of business as usual, particularly by Graham Turner from the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute. His research shows that the forecast made in the 1972 Limits to Growth book are largely correct. As, in, as incredible as those forecasts were when I read them in 1972, most of them have actually been uh, exceeded by development since. Maurice Strong was the person who pulled together that first conference in 1972. And he had this to say, we may, get, we may get to the point where the only way of saving the world will be for industrial civilization to collapse. Our species will not destroy the earth. We may make it uninhabitable for ourselves and for many other species, but we will not destroy it. That will be left for the sun to do in many millions of years time. But we may make the earth uninhabitable for ourselves. So we live in a finite world which is now overpopulated with extreme stress on soils, real problems about food supply, big problems about fish in the oceans with sharing the oceans with far too much plastic, big issues about water, same amount of water of course on planet earth but differently distributed causing flooding and drought, big problems about energy supply moving forward and really big problems about oil and minerals and metals. And this causes us real problems. It causes pollution, causes climate change, means that we can't address poverty very well. We have food shortages and famine. We have conflict and refugees. The migration crisis that everyone is talking about is directly a consequence of the fact that we are exceeding the current capacity of our planet. One of the ways of understanding this is to say that the change we're seeing in our finite world is non-linear. It's not a slow progression. It will at times accelerate. And that's what's been happening. I'll show you in a minute that the acceleration has taken place. There are feedback loops which speed up the process. One of the things that causes me a lot of personal concern is we are now monitoring the strength of the Gulf Stream which runs up the west coast of my country. If the Gulf Stream reverses, there'll be really significant changes in climate for large numbers of people in the Northern Hemisphere, and we'll have the same kind of climate as Northern Canada. Aristotle, writing before the current era, era talked about phrenesis. And phrenesis is about the ability of people to look at what they're trying to do and look at the unintended consequences. And one of the problems with addressing sustainability, as I'll show you uh, later in this presentation, is that we get lots of unintended consequences, some of which are extremely serious and exacerbate the problem that they're designed to remove. The unintended consequences have to be thought about before they start to happen. Our Earth, then, is finite. Now, Buckminster Fuller, years ago, the early 70s, wrote 
the, the operating manual for Spaceship Earth. I think it's now out of print. It's hard to get hold of a copy. 1972, limits to growth. We've already talked about that. Then written up again with an update in 2004, 2014, and most recently, Kate Rowell's book on donor economics. I've written the paper on tourism in the finite world, which is going to be presented um, and published for COP28 later in the year. Now, Kate Roweth has suggested that we need to look at the Earth in terms of donor economics. And the outer strong black circle you can see there is the ecological ceiling to what we can take out of our environment. And she's making the point that we cannot exceed that without damaging our environment and ultimately damaging ourselves. And then the inner black circle defines the social foundation of a good society for everyone on planet Earth. And between those two lines is the safe and just space for us to live within. But the truth is, we're breaking through those boundaries. We've got a lot of people living below the social foundation, and we've got a lot of people consuming beyond the ecological ceiling. The consequence of this is that we get a big problem going forward. The next slide then is taken from some work done by Stefan and a whole other group of scientists published in 2009. And it shows the systems, the earth system trends from 1860 to 2010. The dark red line in the middle I have added, and that's around 1950. When, as you can see, there was a great acceleration as we move from the Holocene, in which most of our evolution as a species has taken place, into the Anthropocene. And it's that great acceleration which is causing the increasing problems there. Plastic waste, I'm not going to talk about a lot, but we need to remember we've got now five gyros of plastic. And anybody who's seen the movie, The Graduate, will recall the advice given to Dustin Hoffman by uh, an older man to get into plastics because this was an emerging field where there was lots of money to be made. That film was in the early 1960s. And you can see the consequences now with those gyros of plastic from that development. This is a great photograph of the Anthropocene with a surfer surfing in water with lots of plastic waste in it. So I would argue that we've now arrived at a new normal. A new normal which is described by the Secretary General of the UN as code red for humanity. Let me remind you what he said in August last year. The facts are undeniable. The abdication of leadership is criminal. The world's biggest polluters are guilty of arson of our only home. Nearly half of humanity is living in the danger zone now. Many ecosystems are at the point of no return now. And unchecked carbon pollution is forcing the world's most vulnerable on a frog march to destruction now. The problem is now. It is not in the future. It is with us now. And I want to illustrate that with some photographs which are publicly available but rarely seen. Earth saw its third warmest May in, 19, in 174 years this year. What you see there are fires burning right up against the snow zone in Alberta in Canada. Here we have graphed the decline in the Arctic sea ice cover. Again, record lows this year in 2023. The graph curves because it's giving you the seasonality. And obviously in the winter it gets thicker and then thinner again. But you can see over time it's losing at 13% a decade. That's a very rapid rate of change. And then you look at the polar silk road, this opening up of the passage through the Arctic for commercial shipping. That might be a plus, particularly actually if you're in Finland. However, what we're going to see is the militarization of those zones. So what we're seeing now is significant climate impacts all over the world. It's no longer just in the southern hemisphere. It's now all over every country in the world is now experiencing significant change 
from climate change. It's become the new normal. And I said, we're going to see militarization. And one of the reasons for that is because of the oil and other minerals which are going to become available in the Arctic because of climate change. And people are actually beginning to draw already the militarization map showing where the new frontiers are going to be drawn. Whole new areas for warfare and conflict about the access to minerals in the Arctic. So, this is very recently published, 14th of June, by the European Environment Agency, talking about what they think is going to happen this summer. More, stronger and longer heat waves. We know they killed a significant number of people last year. More frequent and extreme flooding. It's already started to happen. More frequent and severe droughts. France has got a serious problem right now with its agriculture because of drought. More widespread wildfires. Incredibly, we've had wildfires in Scotland and Wales, which are normally too wet for wildfires. And we're going to get a rise in climate-sensitive diseases. Now, unrelated to climate change, this next map, which shows um, World Health Organization's tracking of epidemic events in 170 country, 172 countries, between 2011 and 2018. When you have the opportunity to look at this in more detail, take a close look at North America, because that's where an awful lot of these examples of emerging and re-emerging diseases come from. There are as many in the Northern Hemisphere as there are in the South, although we don't much talk about that. So why are we here? Well, I think we're in this situation because of procrastination. Never do today what you can put off until tomorrow is a lousy principle for life, but it's even a worse principle for managing our environment. Let me remind you about the Stern Report, which shocked people when it came out in 2006. This was research done by Professor Stern for the British government um, at the request of Gordon Brown when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. The point Stern made in that report was that the cost of stabilising the climate, the cost would be significant but manageable. Delay would be dangerous and much more costly. Guess what we did? We delayed. All over the world, people have delayed. So now the world is more dangerous and it's going to be much more costly to do something about climate change now than it would have done if we'd started way back in 2006 or preferably even earlier. That is my generation's fault and my generation's guilt. Very rarely do you hear what the Queen thinks. This, uh, this short recording, uh, which you can access on the BBC website, was recorded at the Welsh Assembly Building in Cardiff. And she's heard saying, it's very irritating when they talk, but don't do. She's drawing attention to the irresponsibility of just talking about the problem with fine words, but doing nothing about it. It's interesting, isn't it, to see our Queen, who's not normally involved in politics at all, making such an important point. Years ago, when I was working in a different career in adult education, one of my tutors ran a current affairs class, the subtitle of which was, Never mind the patter, watch the hands. It's not what people say that matters, it's what they do. An American historian of science based at Stanford wrote a really important book in 2010 that most academics have not read. It comes out of the uh, history of science, stable, not widely read by other academics. But it's an important book because what it reveals is how a handful of scientists obscured the truth on issues from tobacco smoke to global warming. There's a kind of playbook that they use to delay change. That was then turned into a film. It's, it's Most of the time it's available on Netflix, Merchants of Doubt, uh, which is a documentary film based on the book. And then much more recently, Jennifer Jacket published The Playbook, 
um, which is a, a manual in how to deny science, sell lies, and make a killing in the corporate world. It's, I hope it's a spoof. But if you read the book, you can see the techniques which are being used to deny activity on climate change being deployed by people in the industry, explaining why it's a bit too soon to make the change. It's really not as bad as we think. Some scientists deny that climate change is happening. A whole range of reasons which are used to deny action. So there's no easy solution. But of course, if you want business as usual, people will look for easy solutions. So we have SAF, Sustainable Aviation Fuel. And there's three different kinds of SAF which get mixed up because they're all called SAF. I've given them slightly different names. So SAF W is made from bio waste, mostly food waste being turned into aviation fuel. Now, there are big efforts going on around the world to reduce the amount of food waste because people are starving. So this seems to me to be a very unreliable and probably undesirable way of creating fuel to run aircraft on. Then there are biofuels, SAFB, which inevitably compete with agriculture, pasture or fish production because they have to be grown in the sea or on land. And what it's doing, if you adopt this strategy, is prioritising aviation fuel over food and protein to sustain human beings. That seems to me to be fairly reprehensible as well. Then we have SAF-E, known as power to liquid fuels. These are syn fuels, synthetic fuels derived from hydrogen and captured carbon emissions, which could become scalable at considerable expense. Those synthetic fuels require water, renewable electricity to produce the hydrogen and carbon dioxide. You combine those together and it makes fuel. We'll come back to that. In January 2021, two years ago, the Fueling Flight Project pointed out to the European Commission, and this included companies like uh, Air France, Finnair, EasyJet, IHG. They pointed out, sorry, the IAG, the International Airlines Group, they pointed out to the European Commission that there was a real danger that these massive capital investments in things that increase emissions compared to fossil fuels and or that become stranded assets. So here are people in the aviation industry saying maybe SAF isn't the way to go. And you look at the regulations and we're looking at 6% of the aviation fuel can be SAF in the foreseeable future. This is not going to make a significant distance. Now, my guess is most of you have not seen the next slide. It's something which should be taught in every school and in every university because it, it explains what the problem is about carbon emissions. Very simple concept, but it's all about stocks and flows. The truth is that the inflow is carbon, primarily carbon, but there are other greenhouse gases, emitted as a consequence of human activity, and aviation is one of those human activities. The carbon comes out every year, goes into the atmosphere, and it lingers for between 80 and 100 years. So what happens is that stock, the bathtub, you can see the blue water rising as the carbon flows in. And the outflow only happens when the carbon gets removed from the atmosphere through some process of natural sequestration, being absorbed back into the oceans or being taken up by trees. But the brutal truth is that the carbon emitted when I fly from London to Helsinki, from Helsinki to the avascular, has come out the back of the plane and is there now. If I was to buy trees and plant them, they might, if the tree went full term, in the next 80 years, absorb the carbon that I've emitted. But the carbon's still there. It's there immediately contributing to climate change. So the notion that you can get rid of climate change and of carbon by planting trees is highly questionable. Nor are biofuels the answer, because CO2 is emitted faster than it is absorbed by trees, plant life on the oceans, and consequently it accumulates in the atmosphere. Even worse, 
When biofuels are burned, they emit roughly the same amount of CO2 per unit of energy as petroleum fuels. Therefore, using biofuels instead of fossil fuels does not change how quickly CO2 flows into the climate bathtub. It might be circular economy, but it's not circular ecology. The biofuel emissions add to the carbon in the atmosphere as much as carbon burnt from fossil fuels. The scientific base paper on which this is based, and you can see the reference here at the bottom, once carbon has been removed from the air, it rarely makes sense to expend energy and emissions to process it into biofuels only to burn the carbon and re-release it into the atmosphere. It's a nice idea, but it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because people don't th think through, as Aristotle demanded, they do not apply phrenesis and think about the consequences of doing this clearly and dispassionately. This data is available. I'll give you the website address. This is the only continuous source of data on climate, on carbon in the atmosphere that we have. It comes from Hawaii. It was set up as a scientific research project in the 1950s, and it's run continuously. And what you can see is that when you look at the data over that time frame, we haven't dented it. It's on, going on and on up without us dent, denting it at all. You can see between May 21 and May 23, there's been an increase of three and a half parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There isn't that much in the atmosphere to cause global warming. It doesn't take a lot. We're simply not reducing the stock of carbon in the atmosphere at all, let alone fast enough. So let's come to the precautionary principle, which uh, at one point was quite a lot talked about. I can remember it vaguely from the 1990s. In the 1990s, we had a chemist uh, as prime minister of the UK. Margaret Thatcher was a trained chemist. She understood the mechanics of what was destroying the ozone layer. Um, and the precautionary principle came out of that. If an action or policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment, in the absence of scientific consensus that the action or policy is not harmful, the burden of proof that it is not harmful falls on those taking an action. It's for the polluter to demonstrate that it's not dangerous. This is the historical record of what's happened on ozone. And if you're interested, it's a very powerful book by Karen Lipfin on the ozone discourses, talking about the process by which the precautionary principle was applied in the, sec in the first part of the 1990s. So what you can see is that despite the policy being applied, and this was replacing um, refrigerants basically with an alternative which was cheap and available, it didn't begin to turn around. The peak year is 15 years later in 2000, and it's still only coming down slowly as the ozone layer is repaired. But that was somewhere where action was taken internationally and has been effective, but it's still slow to recover the damage that was done. I can understand why the Just Stop Oil movement is gathering pace. I think if I was a young person now, I would be an activist in Just Stop Oil. This is the crisis confronting that generation. And it's interesting to see that the people on those demonstrations are generally either young people, not yet who've become parents, or grandparents, worried about the consequences for their grandchildren. It's actually extremely easy to stop climate change. We just need to stop burning fossil fuels coal and oil. If we stop doing those things, we won't make carbon in the atmosphere any worse. But as I implied earlier, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. One of the madnesses which is now being talked about is using pig fat as a green jet fuel. The experts are pointing out that if you do that, you would need a never-ending supply of animals or animal fat. 
and they reckon that it would cost about 8,800 dead pigs to fly a plane from Paris to New York. In the EU, airlines will have a 6% sustainable fuel target for 2030, of which 1.2% must come from e-kerosene, leaving you with 4.8% derived from animal fat, and that would be 400 pigs per transatlantic flight. Now, what's the problem with doing that? It is that everybody else who might want to use animal fats is going to have to use palm oil distillates. So we'd actually be driving up the amount of palm oil being used by industrialised economies, doing further damage to the environment. This is no answer. This is just a madcap idea. Occasionally, somebody really senior says something incredibly sensible. This is the Scott Kirby, who's CEO of United Airlines. You, you can catch his interview on YouTube. Planting trees cannot be the answer, he says, because there is not room on the planet to times as many trees. He reckons you need 400 times as many trees. Simply not possible. Delta Airlines is now being sued for a billion dollars for its carbon neutrality claim, which plaintiffs say is false and misleading as it relies on offsets that do little to mitigate global heating. This is planting, mostly planting trees. The Advertising Standards Authority in the UK and the European Union are both tightening regulations on greenwashing. I've written about it. You can pick it up on my blog on Travel Tomorrow. I thought at this point we should lighten the mood a bit. This is a brilliant piece of film, still available. You can find the, the web link is there. This was the bright idea that somebody had on Valentine's Day, getting these two likely lads out on the street, trying to sell love offsets to people. It's a very simple thing. If you've been naughty and gone with another woman or another man, and you're feeling guilty and you should do something to put it right, they will take some money off you and give it to a couple who are loyally staying together and still married. So the consequence of that is that your cheating has been offset by giving the money to a uh, honourable and loyal couple. And that's actually what carbon offsetting is. That's what it is. It's about paying someone else to absolve you of your guilt. It's like a medieval pardon where you give some money to the church to offset your sins. So we come to decarbonisation. The scientists have started to talk about being at net zero by 2050. The problem is that that's now being used as a reason to delay taking action. It's what the scientists call a dangerous delusion. The carbon emissions, as I've already said, are cumulative. The SAF-W, the SAF-B, the SAF-E will all be contributing to the growth of carbon in the atmosphere. So that to leave it until 2050 is nuts. It's a dangerous delusion. The idea of net zero, the scientists say, has licensed a recklessly cavalier, burn now, pay later approach, which has seen carbon emissions continue to soar. Offsetting is akin to a medieval pardon. Aviation is the Achilles heel of the tourism industry. There has to be a step change. If countries, the Caribbean, the Pacific, the Gambia, are to continue to have a tourism industry or be left to starve. So, three climate scientists working in different universities came together to write a paper which is published in the conversation, which you can easily access. I've given you the reference. This is a great idea. Unfortunately, in practice, it helps perpetuate a belief in technological salvation and diminishes the sense of urgency surrounding the need to curb emissions. The idea of net zero has licensed a recklessly cavalier burn down pay later approach, which has seen carbon emissions continue to soar. 
It's also dis- hastened the destruction of the natural world by increasing deforestation today and greatly increases the risk of further devastation in the future. Carbon offsetting by planting trees does not produce carbon neutrality. So where are we now? If you think it's been depressing so far, this I think is worse. This is the International Energy Agency's objective assessment of where we were in 2022. So it's recently published. The global energy related CO2 emissions in 2022 grew by 0.9%, 321 million tonnes, producing a new high of more than 36.8 billion tonnes of carbon emitted into the atmosphere last year. They do say that for the first time the rate of growth in carbon emissions was below that of economic growth, suggesting that some degree of decoupling is taking place. But the truth is that a 7% reduction is needed every year to meet the goal of halving emissions this decade. Now, I don't think I need to tell you that that's not going to happen. About half of the increase in oil-related emissions in 2022 was due to a rise in air travel. Now, why does that happen? Well, it happens because companies like Wizz Air, this is a genuine advertisement, suggests that you should go to Budapest, Gdansk, Warsaw or Krakow because the beer is cheap. And people go for cheap beer at the weekend. You couldn't make this stuff up. It's a kind of madness. So we come back to Code Red for the environment and for, human- for humanity. We are dependent upon the natural ecosystems around us. Now, if you thought all that was depressing enough, this slide really sums it up. This maps carbon emissions around the world using 2018 data from the European Commission that tracks tonnes of CO2 per 0.1 degree grid, roughly an 11 square kilometre grid. And what it shows us is the shipping routes and the airline routes between the continents and the areas of really high emissions, India, China, Europe, North America. Very high rates of emissions. But you can see the aviation routes and the shipping routes between them. I think if anything should make us realise that climate change is a serious issue, this is it. So if we come back to the tourism industry, the Achilles heel of tourism is aviation and to a similar degree, cruising. We should be demanding that the aviation sector adopts and develops zero carbon fuels before there is a forced reduction in flying. Because if we get to 2050, and on some estimates, aviation will then be 25% of all emissions, it's hard to imagine that the state of the world will be in with climate change in 2050, that governments won't just close airlines down, that aviation will go back to being something indulged in only by the very few. Flight shaming is becoming a quite powerful movement. The problem is that flying is not the issue. The problem is the dirty fuel. We need to see a step change in fuel. Now, the last thing I wanted to do with this lecture was just to depress people. So I want to end the next 10 minutes by talking about what might be done to deal with aviation emissions and what I think probably will be done, but which would be done faster if we all put more effort into that and stop playing with crazy ideas like planting trees and SAF. We've already seen iron and steel being produced using hydrogen. Hydrogen is being more and more widely used. What we need to do is to reduce emissions now and speed the transition to hydrogen. Because if we do that, we can continue to fly without polluting our environment. Now, Airbus have introduced the Zero E, and they have three different models of plane. You can see them there under development. They are still 
confident that by 2035 they will be playing a zero E plane. This is probably what it will look like. They launched this program in 2022, so it's well underway. They've now ground tested an engine which has run on hydrogen. They're working closely with EasyJet and with Rolls-Royce engines to develop this. It's a serious initiative. But the more money that went into this in terms of investment, the quicker the result would be pollution-free flying. Now, I put this one in just to uh, make you aware of how much is happening. This is coming from a, a, a daily newsletter that comes out about um, bioeconomy. It's called The Digest. And this is the June 8th report, just one day, of reports on developments in clean hydrogen. Every day there are new developments coming around clean hydrogen and the production of hydrogen which can be used to fuel aircraft. This is very recent, June 7th. They've successfully now using wind power to a non-desalinated seawater to produce hydrogen. And there's a big scheme in the North Sea to do precisely that with a network of these uh, and then collect the, the hydrogen underground and then pipe it ashore when it's needed. India is seeing this as a game changer. India is investing on a massive scale for zero emission hydrogen. The Chinese have a plane, uh, sorry, a, a, a train, universal hydrogen has a, a, a train running on hydrogen. Um, the, the aviation side, it's, sorry, Universal Hydrogen is the plane. The CRRC, in partnership with Chengdu Rail, now have a railway engine and a train running on hydrogen. Even more exciting is the discovery of natural hydrogen, which has been discovered initially in Mali, and it's worth going online to read the story. I went to, I spoiled it a bit by telling you some of it. They drilled down to 108 metres looking for water, but didn't find any. So they withdrew the drill and went away. A man came along several months later, lit a cigarette and threw the cigarette down the shaft, thinking he was going to extinguish the cigarette. There was a blowback of fire and he was slightly burnt by it because hydrogen was coming up that shaft and his cigarette set the hydrogen off. Slowly over time, they have developed that and you can see in the picture there on the right, the, uh, the mechanism by which they are now taking hydrogen out of the ground. Now that will transform the economy of Burukabugu in Mali. It's going to create a real growth hub for hydrogen powered engineering in that part and it's pretty clear that this natural hydrogen exists in significant parts of the world they found some in the Pyrenees and they have maps now of where it's likely to be so people are now prospecting for natural hydrogen now the interesting thing about natural hydrogen is as far as we understand it it's created by the movement of the tectonic plates on water underground so it's actually being renewed all the time. This is a renewable resource taking, being renewed in real time. How much hydrogen you could take off each year without reducing the volume, we still don't know. But the point is there is natural green hydrogen out there underground. This is the depressing image that we should all take away with ourselves. This is the image we should take to motivate us to make a change. Thank you for listening.